Okay, well, I guess we're going to get started. So we have an hour to go through this. Uh, you know, welcome to a virtual conference. It's a little strange for me because I haven't really done these uh, during the COVID kind of pandemic. So I really like in-person conferences and in-person talks because I can get some feedback. So if anyone has questions, put them in the chat. Uh, you may look at see me looking down, uh, but uh, just answer, ask any questions and I'll try to answer them. But welcome to this talk. We're going to talk about the language of HTTP and how that uh, reflects in your APIs. So let me get my controller. Uh, my name is Chris Woodruff. Just a little information about me. You can see my email address, my Twitter. Uh, I work at Rocket Mortgage as the team leader for developer relations. And that's enough about me. I, I try not to go into too much about myself. So uh, in this talk, we are not going to have any code. Uh, this is a, I, I say this is kind of an open discussion, philosophical uh, talk because I kind of hit a point a couple years ago where I saw so many APIs that were not, I won't say done incorrectly, but didn't really convey the information that they should have once they were released out to the to the wild and people could consume them. So, uh, so let's go on with this talk and see how everyone thinks about it. Nope, went the wrong way. So where did we come from? So, you know, as you can tell by the gray in my in my goatee and maybe in my hair, uh, I've been around for a while, uh, about 25 years. So in that span, I've seen a lot of different stuff come up. So let's go through where we came from so we can talk about where we're going. So let's talk about types of web services that we've had since the internet kind of came into being. So we've had remote procedure calls, RPC, which actually we've looped back around uh, with gRPCs. Uh, so that's, you know, everything kind of comes back in fashion, I guess. Uh, like right now, 80s are back in style. My kids are wearing more 80s type of clothes when I was a teenager. And then we, uh, so we moved from RPCs and into SOAP. So if you remember SOAP, uh, you remember WSDLs and all that, and it wasn't a bad uh, web service protocol. Uh, there were a lot of good things about it, but was very heavy uh, and very ceremonial. So you had to do a lot of stuff to, to kind of get things working. And then we just had calls over HTTP and people were doing ad hoc stuff over HTTP. And it was, it was kind of, I call it the wild west. Then we hit this idea of representative state transfer and, and, you know, rest and restful. And we kind of gone beyond that in some ways. Some people like don't like rest and some people do. Some people kind of stray somewhere in between. I'm more of an in-between guy. I try not to get too bogged down by by rules of rest and try to use what I what I can and what I'm more comfortable with in the rest space. But we'll talk about rest in a little while. So let's go through kind of an evolution of services. So so we all know we have databases, and databases have been around since the 70s. And when I started uh, after college, I was doing a lot of Power Builder uh, for the, about the first year or so, and it was client-server technology. So client-server, you had a desktop app that had a direct connection to your database. And this is, for the most part, I'll say, uh, the 90s outside of the internet were built this way. 
Then we had the internet. So people had web browsers that would go to a web server that would then go to their database. And you know what? We had this, these two models for the longest time. Uh, I'll say for most of the 2000s, this is how things worked. More and more API started cropping up and uh, it kind of took a new uh, model for services. So instead of uh, everything going into the uh, directly to the database, we started seeing a shift. And we started seeing our desktop apps and our client facing apps. So JavaScript applications written in Angular and React and, and just pure JavaScript started migrating to use the APIs that people were creating, which then went to the database. And, and they were sitting on web servers for the most part, but I show this, the web server uh, icon in here to be a traditional HTML uh, serving web server type of, type of kind of functionality. But where APIs really prospered is with mobile. So mobile applications also started using APIs and that's where I think APIs really hit the tipping point and where we we saw them just explode in our industry. So let's understand the HTTP protocol because I don't think you can build your APIs without understanding HTTP. Now, Microsoft and their ASP.NET core uh, web API kind of helps you out and hide some of the HTTP protocol uh, behind some of the, the uh, code that, that they allow you to write. But I think to have a good concept of what an API can do and what it should do, you need to really understand the HTTP protocol. So do I expect you to read the entire HTTP uh, protocol document. No, I, I don't expect that. But I do expect people to understand enough of this to, uh, to kind of build their APIs and also consume APIs. So this talk isn't just about building APIs. It's about building the clients that can consume them to have this two-way conversation, hence the language of HTTP. So what do we have to know, or what should I, what do I think you have to know about HTTP? Well, first, I think everyone should understand what HTTP methods, or some people call them verbs. You should really understand the request header, the body of the request, the response codes that you get from the API, and the response header, and response body. So we'll take a look at, at these in this talk. So, you know what, clearly um, in a way, H APIs can be looked at as when I first started in the industry as a client server type of, type of uh, uh, relationship. We have a client role that initiates an interaction and we have a server role that responds to that interaction, that responds to the request that the client gives. And it's as simple as that. It's, it's not really complex if, uh, if you really take a look at the, the, basis, the basics of this relationship. Everything is, is initiates and, and responds. So, First, we're gonna take a look at some of the uh, HTTP methods or verbs. So the most common ones are the first four that we see here, the get, the post, the put, and the delete. And they really correspond, if you think about it, uh, in, in terms of databases, 
they were they were correlate to the crud. So get is like a select, a post is like a insert, a put is an update, and a delete is a delete. And then we have this head. So head is the same as a as a get verb, but you don't get a response body. So I always say use a head if you just want to, sometimes if you just want to check to see if a uh, uh, API calls is even possible. If you do a head and you get a 200 back from it, you're pretty safe that you should be able to get uh, what you want. And also the head is used with, uh, sometimes it's used with cores. So there's also some other HTTP verbs and methods that, that people use. So uh, patch um, is used, a trace, uh, options. Options is really used. You'll see options a lot when you're doing cross origin requests or cores, uh, especially if you take a look at the traffic going back and forth. Uh, a lot of times you'll see that before an API call can be done, the consumer of the API will send out an options to see if that uh, request can be can be done. And uh, some people don't like that, but it's just the way that we have to do cores uh, going forward. Uh, and a lot of people get confused because they see this traffic going across. And, uh, you know, when I first started out doing doing APIs, I was like, why are we having three API or three calls uh, across the wire for one for one call that I need to do? But it is it is safe, and just so you can figure out the consumer can figure out what uh, options and requirements are associated with uh, a resource. In this case, an API call, and then we have connect which you can use to establish a tunnel to the server uh, through SSL. Uh, but for the most part, I haven't really dealt with Connect, but it's, it's an interesting uh, concept going forward. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that. So let's take a look at the HTTP request. So it's made up of a header and a body. So the header is made up of and includes all of the uh, uh, metadata about the request. And the body includes all of the data that you want to transfer over. Sometimes the body can be empty uh, in respect to a get. Uh, and sometimes, even if it's a get, it will send over potentially some information that the server uh, can use to to uh, figure out what uh, is needed for the request. So there's lots of different ways to send over uh, data across through an, H an HTTP request. Sometimes you can send it across in the URL, you can send it across in the header, and you can send it across in the body. And that's why kind of APIs are so... Uh, confusing in some ways because everyone has different philosophies on what they and how they want to uh, send and receive information from a from an API. So a uh, typical request header may look like this. So you'll have a from, you'll have uh, a user agent. So this is just saying uh, who is kind of calling this. So if you're doing it from a web browser, the user agent will be that web browser. If you're doing it from um, a application, then the application, maybe it's a desktop or a mobile application, will send over some kind of indication what the user agent is. And then you have accept, which uh, when you call an API, you should always send over what type of information that you expect to get back from the uh, API server. In this case, we're going to expect uh, text 
in the format of HTML. And then you can also say accept encoding if you in, uh, accept uh, uh, encoding so that maybe it will encrypt it or uh, maybe it will zip it up and have a smaller payload coming across. And then you'll have a content length. Uh, you should always send that over across so that when something gets received, when this HTTP request gets received by the API, potentially it could check to see if the content length is equal to what it's figured out uh, to be the, the uh, size of the content included and have some, some checks and verification. And also the content type. So you send that over, and in this case, uh, you're telling the API endpoint that JSON is what is inside of my body. So it at least knows how to uh, and what format is going to be inside the body, which uh, is sent with the header or inside the request with the header. So let's take a look at an example of a get. So this is a get, uh, I grabbed this a while ago. Uh, these version numbers may be old, but uh, this get is for my web server, my personal website, chriswoodruff.com. So it's saying that uh, the get and then the path that I want. So I'm trying to get back the index for this website and I'm using the version 1.1 of the HTTP protocol. And then I just have from my email address, user agent is uh, a Mozilla using Apple WebKit. And it's, it's also including some Chrome version and Safari version. And, and what I accept back from this is, is HTML content. Now, if I was doing a post, I would have a slightly different uh, uh, header, I would say, or a different uh, request uh, sent over. I would have the verb post uh, to whatever the index is. Uh, in this case, I'm still sending it over to an HTML. In uh, API terms, I would send instead of sending it to an index.html, I could send it to an endpoint of my API. But again, I have to tell it what version of uh, the HTTP protocol I'm using. And then I'm gonna say from, and then user agent for this post is a tool called HTTP tool. And it also has a version. So I know who it's coming from. Uh, content type that I'm sending over is uh, HTML and a content length is 3,200 uh, uh, bytes. So that's just a little example of two different types of uh, requests. So let's move on. So we, we talked a little bit about the request side. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about now that you sent over the request over to the API, what are you going to start expecting to come back from the API? And before I dig into the, the HTTP quest, HTTP uh, response uh, information, I want to go over the response codes because they are what is key to this, to the information or the language that is going to be uh, communicated back and forth with the uh, consumer of the API. So we have five different types of uh, uh, responses. So they're, they're kind of grouped together in, in different ways. So the first one is the 100s are information responses. You're probably not gonna see too much and too many of those. So we're gonna kind of skip over those and we'll really take a look at the, the last four. So 200s are all successful. 300s are redirects, but I use them in a slightly different way sometimes. Uh, 400 is a client error response, meaning that 
there's some type of uh, you are calling the API or calling the the uh, or using HTTP requests in a in a different way than what is expected by uh, who's ever responding or or reacting or to that interaction from the consumer and uh, 500 level is a server error response. And that means that something happened on the server side. Um, so it's nice to have a breakdown between the client error and the server error uh, going forward. It, it can communicate a lot just, just between knowing it's a 400, some type of 400 and some type of 500. So let's take a look at uh, some of the breakdown of, of those. So first, we're going to take a look at the 200. So 200s are pretty, pretty often what we expect to see, what we want to see back from our API calls. So 200 is an OK. A 201 means that the resource was created. So this could mean, hey, I sent over a post and uh, for some type of information, maybe it's a a new invoice that needs to be added to to uh, your your uh, invert invoicing or sales application. And if a two hundred one comes back from a post, usually it means that that resource uh, was created and everything is fine. That invoice is now inside the system. Uh, two hundred two can mean accepted also. So sometimes people send over a 202 and sometimes people send over a 200. That's where I say different people have different dialects for their APIs. Uh, and then a 204 is a, uh, is a accepted but no content is being delivered back. So usually with a 200 or a 201 or a 202, you'll get something back from the API or from the server that you're calling uh, inside your HTTP response body. But the 204 is going to tell you everything was fine, but I haven't sent you back any information uh, that is related to the, to the uh, request that you made. So uh, I like using 204s a lot especially around certain situations, and we'll talk about those. So 300s are uh, not really used a whole lot, but I use 304. So for me, a 304 can be used if I'm going to try to update a resource and that uh, update doesn't take because it's an identical match to what's in the system. So imagine I send over an invoice and it uh, gets created. So it returns back a 201 and uh, which is fine, but say my system sends over that, uh, that invoice again and no changes have been done to the invoice, but for some reason it gets sent back over across the wire. I, I don't really want to say okay because then there's going to be an assumption that that invoice was accepted as is. I want to communicate that that uh, invoice was accepted, but it wasn't modified. The, the resource that I have on my API side wasn't touched because what I received from the consumer of that API, um, nothing was different from, from what I got the second time. So I'm going to send back a 304, which means not modified, which shows that for me, there's some communication, that there's some, some uh, distinct message I can send back to the consumer of the API that says, Look, I received this, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna use it to modify because it's identical. 
And then there's some other ones, the 307 and 308 are for telling the, the consumer of the API, in my case, either there's a, uh, the resource that they're looking for isn't at this API, maybe it's at a different one. So if you're building uh, lots of APIs in your corporate setting and someone requests a uh, maybe a information about a part or a product uh, and they they send it in and you go, well, it's not here, but I know it's over here at another API endpoint. You can either send back a 307 or a 308. A 307 means it's a temporary uh, redirect or a 308 is a permanent redirect. So if maybe a uh, API was down and you need to just say, hey, for just for this once, go to this other system and you'll get the information that you're looking for. Or a 308 just says, look, it's been moved over to this other, other URL or this other M API endpoint, like figure out and go over there, but it's gonna be over there forever. So that's a 307 or 308. Now the 400s are probably the most numerous ones that we're going to get. So that's why I kind of uh, work on these quite a bit and talk about these because they're they're the uh, the client side errors that the system needs to convey back. And this is really important to have distinct errors that uh, we can convey back through the language of HTTP to the consumer of the API to know that they did something wrong. So a 400 is a generic bad request. So, you know, we've all seen 400s, but uh, I think going beyond 400, uh, it's okay if you build a simple API and every error goes back as a 400. But really, uh, you should have different errors to, to communicate back to the consumer of your API so they know, so the system knows what went wrong. So maybe they can log it or they can prompt the, the through the application uh, some good error messages. So a 401 is an unauthorized call. And I use it more for uh, a very high level, like maybe uh, I can't, the consumer of this API is in a place or is outside of maybe a certain territory that they can't get to this API. So for me, I don't use 401 for authentication purposes. I use it more for a higher up, like, Maybe maybe uh, uh, I'm in a different country, a person's in a different country, and maybe my API doesn't accept uh, uh, API calls from, from either a certain place in the world or from a certain domain. So I, I use 401 for like cores and other, other purposes other than authentication and authorization. Now, if we go to 403, which is forbidden, this is where I get into uh, authentication. So if I send over uh, a token through my API call and that token doesn't get accepted because, and what I mean by a token is, a token is uh, used in APIs to do authentication because uh, there's no way to authenticate with an API uh, except if I send over a token and it has the information about the user. Uh, maybe it has the encrypted, it has the uh, 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 some type of string key that will that I can use to go back to an identity server to validate that the, the consumer of this API, whoever made this call is authorized to make the call. So if that's the case and they're allowed to, 
then I go ahead and I do a 200 and everything is good. If they're not authorized to access the API endpoint, then I can give back and I do give back a 403, which is, like I said, is different for, in my case, from a 401. A 403 means you did not authenticate using the method that, that I either authorize using the token, um, maybe the token expired or the token was some kind of hoax and it was a hack. Uh, but for whatever reason, I'm not gonna accept that authorization. So a 404, we've all seen 404s that they mean not found. Maybe uh, the resource that you're looking for, you're looking up that invoice that you thought you put in the system, but someone else deleted that invoice. So you're trying to find the invoice and get 404, and which means that the resource that you're looking is no longer in the system. A uh, 405 is a, in my view, it, technically it's a not allowed, but for me, I use it for authentic, not for authentication, but authorization. So auth Z. So 405 could say, if I send back a 405, it says you're not authorized to get to this resource. Maybe you're trying to get to something that uh, you need admin rights for, or uh, maybe it's some type of rights that are beyond your user rights. Maybe you're a uh, you're an employee, but what you're trying to get to uh, needs a manager level of uh, authorization. So I use 405 to signify that uh, even though you're you're uh, authenticated in the system, you do not have the authorization to get to that resource or to do some type of function. Maybe you're not allowed to delete something or maybe you're not allowed to uh, edit something. So 405 to me is really important. So uh, 406 is not acceptable. So something in the header wasn't, didn't really jive between what uh, I'm anticipating in the API and what the consumer is doing. And then there's a 409, which could be, in my case, I use 409s to have conflicts like business rule confliction. So maybe uh, I didn't send over in the, in the resource. If I sent over a resource and somehow a business rule didn't, uh, it didn't pass all my business rules, I could send over a uh, 409, which means something didn't go well. Maybe maybe the invoice didn't have a positive non-zero total amount, as an example. That could be a business rule. Uh, and then there's some other ones like 410 is gone. Uh, 415 is interesting. So say you want to uh, uh, get a certain format type coming back. So you know, I create a, a API that only will send back JSON. You, in your header, in your HTTP request header, uh, ask for a media type of XML. And my system doesn't know how to create XML uh, content to return back in the response body. So I may give you a 415. You know what? Everything was great, except I can't give you back the, the media type that you want me to. And then there's some other ones, uh, like 420 is unprocessed, but I always say 420 is the enhancer calm if it's a joke. Uh, it, or some people call um, uh, the, the, it's a cannabis type of reference. So kind of a. A funny joke if you in the in the rest api kind of community 420 is kind of a joy joke uh sending it back and forth uh another one that i'm starting to use more and more about oh yeah ava 
So yeah, 420. I usually have Snoop Dogg up for 420, but I, I didn't have it in this talk. Uh, but uh, that could be another another time. But uh, two other 400s that I'm starting to use now are 498 and 499. So a 498, uh, I'm starting to use when a token, when a authorization token has expired. So for me, maybe you uh, you authenticated, but the token has expired, so I can't accept it. So it's it's clearly a slightly different from a 403 because you're you are authenticated, but because of the token has expired, I'm not going to let you in. But I want to tell you that the token's expired, so you can go get a new token come back and try that, that API call again. And then a 499 is going to tell, if you didn't send over a token at all, I'm going to tell you that you have to use a token. So it's this new type of thinking in uh, maybe some APIs to give it a little more clarity that, you know what, this call needs a, needs a token to authenticate and, and authorize. Let's go back. Okay, so 500s are, are internal errors. So a 500 is a generic internal error. Uh, if you're like I like a 400, if you're building your APIs and you just want to stand something up, a 500's fine to send all of your errors back, but not fine for production. So I'll build some APIs and put in 500s and then go back and replace them with more specific ones. So a 501 is a not implemented. That just means maybe I've stood up a, an API and I just, even though I have an endpoint for a certain, a certain uh, uh, method, a certain HTTP method, I just don't have it implemented at this point. It can happen. So 501 just says, you know what? You, you're you in here, you've authenticated, fine. You just, there's just nothing, there's no code in the back implemented to fulfill this request. And maybe this is, maybe you do 501s if you're doing like betas, if you're doing a beta API and you're, and you're having people test that API, a 501 is fine. I wouldn't suggest you keep those 501s around for production because it can get a little confusing. Uh, 503 is service unavailable. So maybe uh, your service, your API endpoint, that service that you're calling, maybe the database is down. And you don't want to send back a 500 because a 500 could mean that uh, there's something generically wrong with that API call, but maybe a 503, you can say, you can uh, communicate that the database is down. So a 503 just says, this service of, is unavailable at this time, and then maybe you can send back an, an error string to your call that, that gives a little more description. Maybe it's maybe it's a third another third-party API that, that you, this API uses to get information is down, or a database or some type of uh, application server, something's just not available to fulfill that request. And then a 504 is a gateway timeout. Sometimes things just time out and your API may just, just bog down and you need to communicate if the uh, if that that call spends enough time uh, waiting to just send back a 504. I don't really use this a whole lot, uh, but I have seen it used in the past uh, when certain time thresholds uh, have been uh, passed and the API needs to send back a 504, which possibly could mean, you know, wait a little bit and try again or just try again immediately and maybe it'll work this time. Uh, and the other ones that, the other 500s that are interesting and that I think we're going to see more and more now that we're into 
having newer HTTP protocol versions like 2.0 is that we're going to see 505s. Someone's calling a API with HTTP 1.0 version of the protocol and the this new fancy API that was stood up only accepts HTTP 2.0 version. So you might start seeing some 504s or you might see a 507 uh, insufficient storage. So uh, if your database gets full and it can't uh, store any more information, uh, just know that a 507 can be can be used to convey an insufficient uh, storage in the back end. Okay, so we've hit all of the response codes. There's lots more that you can use, but I kind of wanted to hit on some of the uh, common ones. So let's get into HTTP responses. So again, we have a header and a body, just like the request. The header includes the response code and some of the metadata so that, that the uh, consumer understands what's coming back and can then uh, access the the information the 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 uh, the response uh, information that is coming back from the API and also it knows how to deal with the body what's inside the body and then the body is whatever is being sent back from the API so it could be text it could be images it could be HTML or JSON but you'll get that information from the header to know what's in the body or the or the type of content that's in the body, the format of it. So a typical header for a response could look like this. Uh, first, we're going to send back the version of HTTP that we're that the server is using, uh, the response code, and then the response code uh, text. So in this case, it's a 200 OK. Um, it's going to send back a date. It's going to send back what the content was encoded. If it was encoded, in this case, it's using it was encoded using gzip. Uh, it could be encoded using gzip and uh, and some encryption type. But in this case, with the gzip, it's going to send back the size of what what was in or the size of the uh, response, the entire response coming back across the wire. And then uh, one thing that that I, I like to make sure people understand is there is a uh, type of caching that uh, is not done at the server side. It's called response caching. It's a server side, functionality, but it gets sent through the header back to the consumer of the API. And in this case, whenever you see this cache.control and it's filled in uh, with something that says like max age, this is letting the consumer of the API know that the uh, who's ever implementing the API has has notified the consumer of the API that the, the content in the response body can be cached for a certain period of time. Now, in this case, 3,600 is the number of seconds. So it's 3,600 seconds. This data, whatever is in the body, can be cached. Uh, and this cache control can, can also tell uh, that no caching is uh, supposed to be used with the, the data, that it's very volatile data coming back from the server and that, uh, that the server has instructed that the, that the consumer of, of the API not cache the data. And, and you can look up this whole thing and how to implement it in your API, it's really easy to implement uh, on the ASP.NET uh, web API side. 
but just know that there is this uh, implied caching. Now, it doesn't mean that the consumer of the API has to cache the information. Uh, it's only avail It's only to be used if if it's been implemented on the consumer side. But I will tell you that most web browsers do react to this to this uh, header property. If you call certain APIs from Chrome, as an example, and you call it once, and you'll see that it takes two or three seconds to get that uh, call back and, and to show whatever is in the uh, body through the browser, if it takes three seconds, but then you make that same exact call again and it's instantaneous, probably this cache control uh, was included in the response header, which told Chrome to cache the information in, that was in the uh, response body and anything up until that max age to use that, uh, that cached information that's in its local storage. So just an interesting tidbit about uh, HTTP and, and uh, caching. And then also we, uh, to round out the, the header uh, properties, you'll have a server type, so you know what server operating system and maybe the, uh, the uh, application that the uh, web server or the application server is using. In this case, it was an Apache web server uh, application. And then we get back, we can get back this allow, which means that uh, the response, I'm gonna tell you what uh, verbs that you can use on the resource uh, that I sent back. Maybe I sent back a invoice, and in this case, maybe an invoice can be uh, updated and but not deleted so I could get a get, a head, maybe a, a, and a put so that you know what uh, uh, types of, of modifications or what type of work that the server can convey back to the consumer of that, of that resource. Went the wrong way again. Okay, so uh, examples, we'll go through this quickly. Uh, HTTP, there's some interesting stuff about some examples. Uh, 404, you'll see that, that this is the typical information coming back. So let's get into REST. So we have about 15 minutes, maybe a little less than 15 minutes. I just want people to understand some things about REST and some of the constraints. So, uh, so REST stands for rep representational state transfer. So all it really means is that a client calls, has a request to a server, and that server will return a representation of the resource. It doesn't send back the actual resource, but it sends back a snapshot, a, a copy of it. And then it can also uh, uh, send back if the, um, the request from the client to the server put that, that resource into a different state. So, so it's all about this communication back and forth. Now, uh, REST was developed by Roy Fielding back in like 20 years ago. Surprising how time flies. But this was part of his uh, doctoral uh, dissertation. And it was just one part of his overall uh, PhD uh, work. But it's probably the most famous part that, uh, that he wrote about in this dissertation. Now, do I expect and have I read the, the entire dissertation? No, and I don't expect you to also. Uh, if you do want to go in and just read about the rest, it's an interesting write-up, but uh, I don't expect anyone to, to, if they want to do APIs, to read the, the entire dissertation from, from Mr. Fielding. 
but I do expect to know for people to know kind of what REST is if they're going to use REST or RESTful APIs. So, so in my case, what really REST comes down to is a is a sentence, is a language. So resources, in my case, is acronym for a noun. So it can be a a invoice or an album or a baseball player stats, something that that signifies a, a thing. Then you have a URL. So this is signifying where that uh, noun resides. So in this case, think about it as you live at a certain location and the and you have an address. Well, the address that you live at is your URL and you as the resource inside that house is the re, is the representational of, of you inside that house. And then we have verbs, which is like a verb and a noun. So if we hook all of these up to have a URL says where a resource exists, and then you can work on that resource using different verbs from the HTTP protocol, really that's what, in my case, what REST kind of is. It's just a simple thing that says, I have location for a resource and I have verbs that can, that can change the state of that resource. And RESTful web services can, can be used in lots of different ways, and, and, but they do have some uh, architectural principles or constraints, and, and we can go through those. So uh, before we go into those constraints, I always say that there's two types of architectural design that people do throughout the years. Either we start with a blank slate and we build everything from the ground up, or we start with and understand the constraints of the system that we're working in and then build our architecture based on those constraints. And in this case, REST uh, uses the constraints, meaning the constraints of HTTP to build out uh, and architect the system where SOAP, really went the other way. It was rebuilding from the ground up uh, what a web service should be. And what Mr. Fielding said was, you know what? We have this HTTP protocol. Let's architect our systems to, to use the constraints and use the beauty of HTTP for the systems that we're going to build on the internet. And that's kind of how I got into, into REST. So let's go through the six constraints of REST. Now you don't have to do all these, but uh, some of the, the uh, later ones can be kind of hard to achieve. But uh, in the ideal world, Felding said that these are the six constraints of REST in his mind. The first one is a client server architecture. I mean, it's kind of the basis of HTTP and the internet. We have a client, we have a server, and they and the client calls for some type of resource using some type of verb from the server and it gets a response. Uh, and the beauty of this is it allows for two components to evolve independently, which increases scalability. So my, my client can call a proxy, which then, can call uh, many different servers so that uh, traffic and, and uh, as a number of client calls to an API grows, it can, uh, proxy can be in between the client and the server to, to handle all those requests. Uh, the second uh, constraint kind of goes along with the, uh, the uh, what the internet really is. is the internet is a distributed, stateless uh, platform. 
So rest constraint number two is everything has to be a stateless communication. So I am not going to send over uh, and expect that a resource is is in some kind of state. I'm gonna I can get that state back in some ways from the server, but I never I never uh, can can expect that I know the state of of what that resource is. Oh, let's go three. Caching. So uh, remember, we have we talked about caching. That is part of the HTTP protocol. Well, REST constraint three is saying that uh, we should use caching inside of our architectures that are developed uh, using HTTP on the internet because it allows us to to have. Um, some some interactions that we don't have to have. So if I build and I cache some information from a API and that cache can can exist for a week, then that cuts down on the number of of API calls that the applications or the consumers of the API need to have. So it will improve the effect effectiveness and scalability of uh, uh, that, but it can also decrease the reliability because of stale data. So if the API sends back that uh, data can be cached for a week and someone goes in and changes a bunch of data on the server side, all the all those resources have been updated or deleted or modified in some way, the consumer of my APIs will never know that until the end of that caching period potentially. So it can it can decrease uh, reliability. So, so you just need to make sure you build your caching uh, models and your caching kind of uh, uh, implementation correctly. Oh, keep hitting the wrong button, sorry about that. A uh, uniform interface. So, uh, so it, this just means that uh, People know a very logical uh, information about where to get that, that resource. So maybe you have an API that uh, the URL is uh, some base URL slash uh, invoice slash and then invoice number. So it just means that you know when you build your build your interface, build it in a, in a logical way that uh, isn't confusing either to a machine or a human that's reading the, uh, the interface, meaning the URL. Oh. The fifth one is a layered system. Uh, Belding just, when he designed and thought about the architectures built in, in the arc, or on the internet uh, using HTTP, he thought, you know, build it as a layered system so we can aggregate certain responsibilities. Uh, and for the most part, it kind of it conveys a, a way that we architect our, our applications uh, in .NET or in any type of language. We usually break up and break it into different layers. Like in my architecture for my APIs, I have an API layer, a domain layer, and then a data uh, access layer. So, so he's just saying that think about building your architectures and layered systems so that uh, uh, you can you can evolve and have less complexity in your in your overall system. And the last one, which I have, I've never seen too many REST APIs uh, do, but the sixth one is code on demand. So Belding thought that if I called an API and something had changed between the consumer and the server, that the consumer could just send down or send back some new code the, which then could be incorporated in the client side, in the consumer side of the API relationship, 
and that new code could be integrated and then it could be used from then on uh, when, when the client or the consumer of the API needed to call that again. Um, again, I, I don't see too much of this, but it is a constraint of the API. So I know I'm probably at my, my limit, but uh, here's a workflow for an HTTP request. Uh, if you go out to my slide deck, you can kind of see the logic that, that I do uh, with this. The quiz, usually this quiz uh, is when I'm in front of people and I get some, some uh, people that want to talk. But if I were to go out to a product and do a get, and what would be the response code for getting all the products in the system? It would be a 200. If I wanted to get a certain uh, uh, subset of products, I would get a 200 also. Uh, if I did a post for a new product, I would get a 201, which means created. If I get a specific one with a, a specific ID for the product, uh, I would get an OK. Now, if I went out and got something that I knew didn't have an ID of 881, I would get a 404 not found. If I put, if I made an update to uh, product 81, I would get a 204. Because in my case, I'm not going to, in, if I'm building this API out uh, this time, I'm going to send back a 204 because you already sent me the product that uh, you put into the system. I'm not going to send it back. You already have it. it I'm going to save uh, some size going back across the wire. Don't need to send you back. All I need to say is it was okay and there's no content in the body. But if I do that one again without any other changes, I'm going to get back a 304 like we talked about because I'm sending over the same exact product. The server side is saying, oh, this matches identical to what I have. So I'm going to send back a 304 not modified. So so it just so the consumer knows. And then a delete will send back a 204 uh, with nothing in the response body. So uh, testing uh, RESTful APIs, there's lots of tools to do this. I use Fiddler, I use Postman, uh, I use ASP.NET Core. Now we're up to 3.1 web, web API to do integration testing. And then there's also editor-based REST clients in uh, Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, and, and JetBrains Writer that will allow you to do uh, REST calls within your IDEs, which are really cool. Uh, but remember, to, to build your APIs, you need to understand HTTP, understand the verbs, understand the uh, response codes, have some understanding of REST if you're building your APIs using REST, and then know how to test those uh, APIs to make them reliable. Uh, at this point, I'm kind of over, so I'm not going to have any question to answer. If you do want to uh, send me any information, that is not my email. That's from my old company. I didn't even check to see. If you go to Chris Woodruff at live or cwoodruff at live.com, it'll get you there. Or you can reach me out on Twitter. Uh, there's my phone number. But the slide deck is out uh, in a link on the top of the uh, chat for this uh, session. Um, I want to say thanks for everyone for attending my talk, and I hope it was valuable. And if you disagree with some of the stuff, please tell me, and we'll have a good debate. Uh, and that's about it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Well, thanks, Eva. 
uh, that's that's very nice of you to say. So uh, I find this talk, a lot of people think it's kind of a simple subject, but as you can see, it took me an hour to go through this. So uh, I think it's valuable. At least it was for me to kind of learn by uh, all the scars the past uh, uh, seven or eight years I've been doing APIs. But I'm sure Kevin, Mr. Griffin will would di disagree with some of my stuff. So, right, Kevin? If he's still around. So, but I want to say thanks. So I'm going to drop off now. If anyone needs to get in touch with me, reach out on Twitter, see Woodruff, and, and thank you.